My name is Karen and I started the spiral trial three and a half years ago. I developed severe high blood pressure. It felt horrible. I had very bad headaches, just really bad severe headaches. Um, I was putting it down to the weather, down to pressure, even though I wouldn't have pressure. Um, and I remember meeting a friend one day and she just said to me, Karen, if I were you, I'd go to the doctor, which I did do, lucky enough, because my blood pressure was through the roof. I left the hospital on 20 tablets a day. My quality of life wasn't great. I was drowsy all the time. I was, I was not myself. There was no such thing as going for a walk. I just, I didn't feel myself. And I heard the trial being advertised on the radio and with some persuasion from my husband, um, I decided that I would come into Cree and I would go on the trial. My husband is very persuasive. He persuaded me to go on this trial. He just seen how sick I was, I suppose, with the tablets and um, I was trying to ignore him for a while. He never stopped, he never shut up about it. So yeah, I ended up having to do this trial because he just kept saying, come on, it can't be that bad. There was a lot of coming in first of like taking your blood pressure, doing a lot of paperwork. And then eventually the day came that the operation was to be had. Um, going down, didn't know whether I was going to get placebo or whether I was going to get the real thing. And didn't know, didn't know until October 12 months ago whether I actually got the real thing or not. But gradually over a couple of months, bit by bit, my blood pressure was kind of easing off. And with the adjustment of just one tablet, my blood pressure went back down to completely normal. And I've been on that ever since, and it's been great. And my life has improved. My health's improved. Future, I think, is looking bright. I've requalified. I'm now an SNA. Loving my job. Went back to college. I've done a diploma in um, supporting uh, young adults in schools, and I love it. I think the trial saved my life. And I'm glad I did this and I would love and I will encourage people to do it. Digui Fagus Majin Wa, Ina Agus Akarda. Peter Dorn is Anam Dom Agus Ta, Anna Ahas Aram, Falja Akurot. Quig campus alling Ulskull na Galava on Majin Shah. Is law Tavokta a a new dar Nulskull Augusta Rajun, August on Institute, Trilica Clinicula, Ashola Aguing. Tri Frastel er Arshola, Tautu Aglero, Dathakiot, Darvish, Garv Mahagut. Hello and good morning, guests and friends. My name is Peter Doran and I'm delighted to welcome you to the beautiful campus of the University of Galway this morning. Today is an important day for our university and our region as we launch the Institute for Clinical Trials. By attending our launch, you are showing your support for our vision. Thank you. For those of us that were here yesterday, I think we will agree that the event was phenomenal. The program, the speakers, the engagement, and indeed the palpable excitement in the air as we introduced our institute was fantastic. I'm not a social media guy, um, but the reports coming to us yesterday morning that Future Trials was trending number one in Ireland above succession uh, is something I'm going to talk about for a number of years. <clears throat> Our speakers yesterday told us what excellence looked like from the perspective of academia, from the perspective of the healthcare system, and indeed from the perspective of industry. Our colleagues across the research environment yesterday afternoon painted the picture that whilst recognizing the challenges that we face in, in research, they were also clear about the opportunity. And of course, our patient stories, just like the one we've already seen this morning, challenge us to continue our important work, to constantly strive for better. Our patients demand it. I'm really struck by uh, yesterday the words from Kate Cameron in her, her video that you will also see later on this morning, where she challenges us to go for it. Uh, yesterday's speakers, I think, set us on that pathway and told us that we here in Galway can be the national lead in this domain, and we will go for it. Today we will formally launch the Institute for Clinical Trials and usher in a new era, era of clinical and biomedical progress in Ireland, led from here at the University of Galway. 
We will share with you a vision for our institute which is based on a number of key principles and I'd like to share those with you now. Firstly, excellence. We will compete internationally. We will benchmark ourselves against the best. We will compete in that arena. Secondly, partnerships. We will strive to create functional partnerships, national and international, academic and commercial, that will underpin our research impact. We will be the best partners anybody can find. We will focus on clinical need, the areas of greatest relevance to global population, but also to our population here in the West and Northwest. We will focus on that population and make sure we were answering the problems, the challenges they face. We will be characterized by a clinical and translational focus. Bill Powderly reminded us yesterday that an emphasis on basic science is critical. As we develop new technologies and new approach, approaches, create new understandings of the uh, biological world, we're in a better position to impact our patients. We will be integrated. We won't stand alone. We won't be siloed. We'll align our programs with the newly created medical technologies and advanced therapeutics discovery research institute. And we will do that to create an environment and a pipeline of best science, but we will do it mainly to impact patients. We will be an inclusive institute. We'll prioritize areas that provide opportunities for the widest cohort of patients for the widest cohort of our investigators. We will emphasize, support, and reward interprofessionalism and multidisciplinarity. And finally, sustainability. We will develop an organization that supports the sustainable delivery of high-class research to patients, research that's sensitive to the environment whilst driving change. These priorities sit within the overall context of our strategic plan. And the University of Galway's strategic plan, shared vision shaped by values, commits the university to being a force for transformation and a force for public good, whose commitment to the core values of respect, excellence, openness, and sustainability are a standard by which the university chooses, defines, and measures our priorities and behaviors. At the Institute of Clinical Trials, we acknowledge, we embrace, and commit to these values. They will guide everything that we do. In particular, these values, this value-led approach commits us to a number of specific things. We will embed the patient and the community experience in everything that we do. I think we've showed our intent in this regard by involving so many of our patients in providing these, uh, these snapshots of their experience. We do that to remind ourselves and to remind everybody of why we're here. From establishing a, an advisory council, which will be populated from, with individuals from right across this region, from all strata of society, to involving patients in trial steering committees, we will set a new standard for engagement. We will ensure our clinical trials are representative of the needs of our community. They're inclusive of the diverse population in the West and deliver on our regional needs. This is something I have thought about an awful lot. In my previous role, I uh, led a clinical research center in the wealthiest part of the country with a very highly educated population with easy access to multiple modalities of transport. Our region is different. We have a dispersed population who have different needs. We will also advocate for our patients. We'll ensure that clinical trials are an accessible option for patients and we'll support the clinical advancement of our region. With our partners in the CELTA Healthcare Group, we will constantly strive to make Galway a place where outcomes are optimized. 
We will also strive to create an environment that is supportive of medical technology, digital health and pharmaceutical companies. A place where, as mentioned yesterday, we are a beacon of excellence, supporting economic development and job creation. This builds on the university's vision to be the centre of the regional economy. Throughout this morning session, you'll hear from a, a number of, of different speakers who will introduce the strategy for the Institute for Clinical Trials. The strategy document can be found in your welcome pack, but in summary, we describe a vision that has been shaped through seven prioritization criteria. These criteria have guided our thinking, guided our vision, and most importantly, guided our ambition. The criteria have enabled us to call out five strategic pillars. We will have five work programs in the Institute. We will develop partnerships. We will deliver best trials. As Katrina Walsh reminded us yesterday, we need to not just say we'll do the trials, we need to deliver. Will we be a centre of innovation for trials? We recognise that contemporary trials must constantly evolve must be better, better to be faster, better to cost less, but better in terms of their availability to patients. We will focus on training the next generation of clinical investigators. We have a number of programs already in existence, a highly successful master's in uh, clinical research, a new master's starting in September in uh, applied clinical data analytics, but we'll go further. We'll work with our healthcare and industry partners to make sure that the training needs of the clinical research community here in Galway, in Ireland and globally are served from here. I truly believe that we can be the best in class. And finally, we will influence. We recognise that the best clinical trials must be turned into policy if they're going to have an impact on our patients. We're committed to this agenda, we have the expertise already, and we will deliver. To support these pillars, we're assembling a leadership team who will deliver all of our strategic objectives. We've identified specific actions which we'll implement over the coming years, actions that align to our vision, to our ambition. We will be accountable for those. We'll be accountable to the university, to the wider community for the delivery of these actions. And let me reassure everybody, we will deliver. I would now like to hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Martin O'Donnell. Uh, Martin is Executive Dean of the College of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences, an internationally leading trialist and investigator, and the originator of the Future Trials Program. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, Dave, our margin, I guess, falls a good deal on OK Show. Welcome to sunny Galway. <laughs> Even the weather recognises the importance of this event, to which we're grateful. I'm going to speak um, on behalf of the College of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences, a multidisciplinary college, an ambitious college, and to welcome you on behalf of that college to the launch of our Institute for Clinical Trials. This is our first research institute that's primarily embedded within our college. A key question is why have we chosen this to be the first one? If you look at the dictionary, an institute is an organization of shared purpose. So through deliberations, through an assessment of our existing strengths, our ambition, our values, our enormous ambition to make a contribution to the evolution of the health and well-being of our society and the broader community, we recognize that clinical trials are a central and focal piece to the advancement of how we treat disease and how we prevent disease. So this is a deliberate statement of purpose. 
a commitment to an ambitious agenda. It's a substantial investment in research excellence, recognizing that research excellence requires a state-of-the-art environment with highly trained specialists accommodating that environment. One of the things you've heard yesterday was excellence, the pursuit of excellence, the concept that the Institute is disease or health agnostic. We champion <clears throat> high-value research that will shift the dial in how we treat patients, how we diagnose, how we rehabilitate, how we prevent disease in the first place. It's building on strengths. It's building on a really strong track record in delivering clinical trials in medicinal products, medical technologies, cellular therapies, and behavioral interventions. Existing strengths in clinical trials are exemplified by the HRV Clinical Research Facility, the CORB Group, clinical trial networks in primary care and diabetes, and trials methodology network. Our plan is to firstly consolidate and give coherence to each of these entities. Individually have been successful, but in many ways have grown organically. And this is an effort to ensure that these are all joined up and function more like an engine rather than separate parts within it. So the Research Institute speaks to our intent in optimizing organizational structure for success. As detailed in discussions yesterday, high-quality clinical research that advances healthcare can only be achieved with a professionally organized environment and populated by a strong team of multidisciplinary specialists in trial design, research methodology and innovation, coordination and delivery. This research insert is born out of deliberations and a series of workshops between our college and the College of Science and Engineering. And this was looking at what our research community needs for a step change in our contribution to biomedical and clinical research. There were open and transparent discussions. There were discussions on the, what is fundamentally a research institute. It has to add value. It has to have an exponential effect on what we do. And from that, there was a recognition that both for our university, our two colleges, our region, including industry and healthcare, that we needed two research institutes. But in a way, those two institutes behave as one when it comes from developing therapies, developing interventions from inception, from idea, right through to implementation within healthcare. The second soon-to-be-launched research institute for medical technologies and advanced therapeutic discovery again will join and is an evolution of existing strengths. It's a consolidation exercise, it's an amplification exercise, but it's also addressing critical gaps in our clinical trial ecosystem. And these critical gaps are not unique to us, they're translational gaps. How do you bridge a community of biomedical researchers and transition into early phase clinical trials? It sounds easy but it's a nut that's very difficult to crack for all institutions. So we're going to specifically invest in that, not just for the important pipelines of discoveries through Quorum, BioInnovate, Health Innovation Hub, but also for the wider industry, recognizing where we are in time and place and the importance particularly of the medical technology, digital and connected health industry within our region. These institutes reflect the breadth of research fields, again, from scientific discovery right through to policy. We see this as bridging a deficit, but acting as an accelerator in the conveyor belt of ensuring that we don't miss potentially new effective treatments. It's a commitment to innovation. Future trials was decided because we're at an inflection point within healthcare through medical technologies, digital and connected health, and particularly artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. We saw the emergence of evidence-based medicine with the explosion of clinical trial evidence and the ability to accommodate it. We're now seeing an evolution, an explosion in technologies, artificial intelligence. 
we have to be mindful of the fact that these need rigorous evaluation, but they, prevent, they provide enormous opportunity, but also challenge. Provides us with new ways of doing trials. We have to think more cleverly about it. But at the center of this are patients, and that these interventions bring value. They bring improvements in quality of life, and a much more diverse series of outcome measures. In that regard, our institute is primarily a commitment to improving the health and well-being of our community, which is an extended objective of our college, additionally through education and training. Through the conduct of transformative research that will be regionally and nationally informed, but globally relevant and important, knowing that most healthcare challenges are shared. Many of the speakers yesterday from different parts of the world articulating the same challenges. The transition from a research question to addressing a health problem. Our decision to prioritize clinical trials recognizes that major advances in healthcare are derived from randomized control trials. You cannot get a grade 1A recommendation for an intervention without a randomized control trial. So in and of itself, we're targeting an action and an intent that speaks to the highest level of evidence in how we treat, prevent disease, not just in individuals, but among populations. We're committed to ensuring a central role, and I'll double down on the topics that Peter mentioned earlier, on patient and public involvement. They have to be central and critical to every aspect of what we do in the Institute of Clinical Trials, from the questions we ask to the respectful way that we deliver them in a safe environment with clear oversight. This was the key reason why this is being launched by Noreen Doyle, a voice representing patients and families who are integral and a central player, the key protagonist within clinical trials because this represents the core value of our objectives to improve the well-being of people. A commitment to conducting highest research standards. Again, you heard yesterday from John Laffey, the presentation of the CRDO, which is pre-populating this agenda with an oversight structure to insist that we do this well, we do this safely, and we do it to the highest standards. A collaborative venture with the Sale to Healthcare Group. This speaks to our commitment to equality, diversity, and inclusion. A challenge in clinical trials has been that they don't fully represent the population that we serve. And again, this will be a key agenda within this trial. Extending that concept of partnership, our first partnership is with patients and the public. But in each of these endeavors, this is a multi-stakeholder venture if we are to get it right, if we are to be successful. And our key partnership is with the healthcare system, particularly Sales University Healthcare Group, PCCC, General Practice, and we welcome representatives warmly today. Very fortunate to have Tony Canavan present, and again, Tony has been a tireless advocate of the importance of clinical trials within healthcare systems. Because we recognize trials aren't just about research. Absolutely, they inform the future of how we treat patients. Trials are critical to identifying what we're doing at the moment that's ineffective or maybe even harmful. Because some of this is greater investment in the healthcare system, but a lot of this is ensuring that what we do brings value. And clinical trials can be so important in freeing up resources by excluding ineffective interventions. But as presenters mentioned yesterday, clinical trials is a culture. And the evidence for that is that healthcare systems that prioritize and invest in clinical trials provide better care, not just for participants in trials, but better outcomes for patients that go through that healthcare system. Because it emphasizes quality. It emphasizes evidence-based delivery of medicine. It emphasizes organization. It emphasizes patient safety. All of the central tenets 
that are integral to delivery of good care. We looked to national and international community of clinical trialists. I thought yesterday was outstanding as today is, but mainly because of the diversity of people who came. It's remarkable the number of people who have skin in this game, either directly involved in clinical trials, beneficiaries of clinical trials, or a wider industry and employment framework within that. So I thank you to the international speakers. It really provided, if anybody had any level of cynicism about the objectives here, it would have been dispersed yesterday with the ambition and the excitement of the talk. We thank funders coming here today, Health Research Board in particular, have invested a lot of the resources in developing a framework to deliver clinical trials. And we see this as a step change, an amplification that builds on those initial investments. HPRA, research and ethic boards. And again, we welcome Robert Watt and Jim Breslin, two secretaries, and I think everybody's looking forward to that discussion item today. And again, understanding how we can solve this, these grand challenges together. From a college perspective, one of the messages we really want to make clear is that this is a commitment to interprofessional and multidisciplinary research. Clinical trials do not exclusively belong to the remit of medics. Transformative clinical trials, A, requires a multidisciplinary team. I've often said I'd much prefer a high-quality coordinator than a high-quality principal investigator because who's important and who leads the teams, who makes trials successful, who makes them safe, is a group of people, but also who leads trials. Jackie Bosch uh, represented rehabilitative science yesterday, seeing that we have to target what's important to patients. We have to transition how we view clinical trials, the types of questions that we address. The other part of multidisciplinarity is that novel research, novel research questions frequently comes from a dialogue between disciplines. I have to say, I've been at so many meetings where either in clinic, patients say something to you and you kind of go, I haven't thought about that. Or within a multidisciplinary research planning meeting, you get different perspectives and novelty comes from within it. So it's not just about effectiveness, it's not just about respect, it's also about if you champion novel research, you'll make it multidisciplinary. This is a statement of intent around leadership. Leadership in what we plan to establish as a national resource for coordination of clinical trials. If we look to other countries within Europe, they're structured differently. We are unfortunately behind many other countries. This we believe is a critical step in catching up and eventually passing out other similar countries within Europe. It's leadership in training the next generation of clinical trials, as Peter has mentioned, in advancing new ways of conducting trials. It's leadership in people. We're here because over the last two decades there's been an investment in a transformal and change within research. It's been an exciting time of unprecedented growth in a culture of research, in the execution of research, and this we would see as a step change within that. The developments are thanks to the enormous efforts of many people, but we'll particularly like to mention Professor Tim O'Brien, Martine Lee Coulon, in their leadership in advancing these developments. Our next phase is a new leadership, and we welcome Professor Peter Dorn with enormous open arms. Uh, he mentioned last night he still doesn't know whether we're fake being nice or whether we're intentionally being nice to make sure that he feels enormously welcome. But if it started off as fake, it's evolved into something very genuine. <laughs> we are enormously fortunate to have Peter at the helm. Not just because of his expertise, his experience, but his ability to make everybody around him better. And I've certainly experienced that myself. So all ships rise when Peter arrives on the scene but it's the authenticity of his passion to advance healthcare through clinical trials. It's his generosity within that, 
and we very much look forward to this. But he is surrounded by a very effective team. So, we look forward to a really bright future. We recognize that we're all in this together. We recognize the importance of this for our country, for our region, for each of our institutions. We see this as a collaborative venture with a singular purpose, which is how institutes should be organized. Thank you for joining us today. Thank, thanks, Martin. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, e even if it was initially fake, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I, uh, one of the things that I, I mentioned yesterday that's most exciting about our initiative um, is the support we're uh, garnering from right across uh, the, uh, the research uh, landscape. Um, and I think that's exemplified also by the uh, some of the presentations yesterday, but, but more specifically this morning, uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Mairead O'Driscoll uh, to the stage. Mairead is the Chief Executive of the Health Research Board, has been uh, an unrelenting supporter of developing the clinical research uh, infrastructure in, in Ireland, and has been a great supporter of what we're trying to achieve here in Galway as well. So, Mairead, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Thanks, Martin, as well, for organizing this absolutely fantastic event. It really is splendid. I was walking over here this morning in the sunshine. We're all commenting on the beautiful weather, but I was contrasting it with a visit that we made, uh, the HRB made, back, I think it was in 2009, when we came to Galway to talk about plans to build a new clinical research facility. Uh, I think at that stage, the HRB had just funded the CRF, but it was working out of temporary premises. I think, if I remember correctly, it was over a cafe or a shop or something like that. And so Martin and Tim brought us out to look at the proposed site for the new building, for the new CRF. And what I remember was this really dismal kind of car park. It was kind of dystopian, you know, like something out of the Blade Runner or something. And standing there in the rain, and remember this was 2009 with the economy crashing down around us, I mean it really didn't look like a very promising prospect. But against all the odds, the CRF was built, it was staffed, and it was opened in 2015. So I think the moral of that story, the message is, it's fair to say, you have an excellent track record here uh, in Galway of delivery. And I'm delighted to be here this morning celebrating the launch of another very important piece of infrastructure, the Institute for Clinical Trials. So as we heard yesterday from my colleague, uh, Therese Maguire, this is an area that the HRB has been committed to now for more than a decade and a half. The investment that we made in the CRF here and in other CRFs as well, it came about because we had a vision for clinical trials research infrastructure in Ireland. We wanted it to be a game changer where every patient could get access to a trial or to a research study if they needed to or if they would benefit. Yesterday we heard about how medical research is generating new discoveries at an unprecedented rate, leading to new drugs, new therapies, devices, procedures, interventions, all with the potential to greatly improve outcomes for patients. But we all know that translating those innovations into practice doesn't just happen. It requires a good infrastructure, a positive environment for clinical trials. And that environment for clinical trials is challenging everywhere, challenging in every country. You have to think about the regulatory requirements, the costs, the staffing, design, trial design, data, privacy issues. To say nothing of all the expertise that it takes and the time it takes to operationalize studies and coordinate them. The absence of that coherent infrastructure for clinical trials in Ireland was highlighted in various reports uh, in the early 2000s. 
So to address that deficit, the HRB has invested more than 200 million, believe it or not, over the past 15 years in clinical trials infrastructure. That's the facilities, the networks, and the research support services. And that's to make sure that Ireland's clinicians and their researchers, all of you, that you have the enabling environment to form partnerships and collaborations with other investigators or with industry, and to make sure that patients have access to those all important trials. So along the way, we've learned a little about what works and how to set up these kinds of infrastructures for success, because it was a learning process for us as well. We thought a lot about the most appropriate kind of funding models. For example, separating out the funding for the support structures and the funding for actual trials. Putting in place a dedicated funding stream for interventions and feasibility studies. And thinking carefully and looking at best international practice on how to use metrics in a constructive and a supportive way. But most of all, I think we've learned about the benefits of working in partnership with the universities, hospitals, with patients, with the HSE, with the Department of Health. And how working in partnership is really the only way to succeed and to make those partnerships and those investments sustainable. And to be honest, even with all of that, we still have some way to go to achieve a fully coherent, integrated ecosystem for trials in Ireland. Even as we celebrate today the establishment of the Institute here in Galway. I think it is important to acknowledge some of the deficits in our system so we can take steps to address them. It still takes a very long time, far too long, to set up a clinical research study or a trial. We don't always have clear lines of accountability or governance arrangements between our universities and our hospitals. And then you have practical problems, and I know they're tedious, but they are important around financial frameworks and data sharing and contracts and all that sort of thing. And I think those difficulties really reflect the fact that we haven't yet, yet, <laughs> fully embedded research into our health system. So collectively, we have a bit more work to do. Anna Teres yesterday from the HSE described the transformation projects that are underway, and I think it's really important collectively that we support her in her endeavours. Some of you may also have been at a very interesting meeting in Farmley a few weeks ago to discuss the establishment of academic health science systems in the new health regions. And that's all about the integration of universities, hospitals, and let's not forget community, community health organisations, with the aim of driving excellence in research, promoting patient care, and educating the next generation of health professionals. That integration, the establishment of formal links between our universities and our health system, is a critical success factor. Nor is it enough to have individual pockets of excellence around the country. A national clinical research ecosystem and access to trials for all patients who need them isn't going to happen on its own. It's not going to be driven by one agency, one hospital, university, or one government department. It's going to require real collaboration as well as partnership. And I think with that in mind, it's great today to see the sec gens from health, from the Department of Health and the Department of Further and Higher Education here. If we had the Secretary General from the Department of Enterprise here, it would have completed the set uh, because they also have a very important role to play. Because if we get it right, of course, the opportunities are enormous for health and for the economy. As we all know, we've heard over the last day, Ireland is home to most of our large pharma companies. Here in Galway, of course, you're uniquely situated, as Peter mentioned, with eight of the world's top 10 medtech companies having a physical presence in the region. And if you take your track record in clinical research and the infrastructures that are in place in the new institute, you are really uniquely placed to be leaders in this space. The landscape for trials is also changing at EU level with the launch of the EU Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, ACT-EU, which is being set up to foster innovation in clinical trials. And as always, when we think of EU developments, the more organized we are here in Ireland, the better able we will be to take advantage and the more we will benefit from those European developments. The fact that Ireland is a member of ECRIN also increases access for Irish patients to multinational clinical trials and makes it easier for Irish researchers to extend their own trials internationally. And one area in particular is getting attention in Europe. Last week, decentralised trials were the topic of the ECRIN International Clinical Trials Day Conference. 
given the geography of this region, the dispersed populations that Peter uh, referred to, and your expertise in primary care clinical trials, you're really well placed to advance these novel types of trials, which would be a great example of having both regional and national impact, putting Ireland on the map. So there's a lot going on, and Galway is an active contributor to this changing landscape through your CRF, the clinical trial networks that you lead in primary care and diabetes, and I think that's being launched this afternoon here, the National Trials Methodology Research Network, and ICAT, the National Clinician Sciences Training Programme being led by the University of Galway. And today we welcome very much the establishment of the University of Galway Institute for Clinical Trials. Not only does it recognise the value and the importance of clinical trials to research, to the healthcare system, to the economy, it also provides a really valuable focal point to work together at local and national level to address key areas in the design and conduct of clinical trials in Ireland. So on behalf of everyone in the HRB, I want to extend my congratulations to all of you here in Galway. Yet again, you have shown great vision and leadership. The talent is here. I've no doubt you're going to be successful. You have our full support in the HRB, and we're looking forward to working with you over the years ahead to realize your ambitions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mairead. Um, your, your strong words of support uh, have resonated uh, with, with all of us, and uh, we're, we're really grateful. Um, and uh, we, we, we look forward just as much to continuing our great relationship with the Health Research Board over the coming years. Um, I, I'm now delighted to, uh, to introduce uh, my colleague, Tony Canavan. Uh, Tony is the Chief Executive Officer of the CELTA University Healthcare Group, and um, well, long before my time, given I'm such a, a recent recruit, uh, Tony has been a great partner to the university, a great supporter of what the university is, is trying to do. Uh, Tony and I uh, have met recently, and we've, we've figured out that we have a, a very strong shared interest in bringing, bringing clinical research right throughout the regions and through the, the region, and, and have already discussed how we established the trials program in, in Letterkenny, in Mayo, and indeed uh, in other parts of the, the CELTA group. Uh, I look forward to working with Tony on that, and uh, again, uh, Tony, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Thank you. Well, we knew that. I guess I could like a good air. It's more a privilege. I was on place for Dumve and Shore on Majan Ian Talk Show. Everybody's commenting about the weather, but sure, why not? We don't get too many chances to do it. What I'm too sucker, La Macupla Fockel, La Cupla Fockel Buicus. Ladies and gentlemen, it really is a privilege and a pleasure for me to be here this morning, and not just because of the weather, but also because I think we're, uh, we're involved in something very important. Um, I'd like to start by saying a few words of thanks, and maybe you'll be glad to hear that that's probably all I'm going to do this morning. I'm not going to dwell too long. First of all, I, I am thankful for the invitation to be here this, uh, this morning. Um, I think, uh, as I say, we will look back in years to come on this day as, uh, as being a really important day in terms of clinical research across this region. I'm very grateful to Peter and to Martin and all of the colleagues uh, for inviting me to be involved in that process. But I also want to extend my thanks more broadly as well. Um, and really, uh, I'm glad that I'm, uh, I have a chance to share the stage to some extent with Uktran uh, Nahalskalya Le Kiran. Because I also want to, uh, to extend a thanks broadly to Kiran, but also to the university for your willingness to work with us uh, in the Safety University Healthcare Group. Um, I'm in this role just um, coming up on four years now. And when I returned into the position of CEO of the Safety Group in September 2019, uh, Kieran and the team from the university, but also the team from the, from the hospital group, uh, were just finalising a memorandum of agreement, uh, which has become the bedrock, or I suppose the basis on which our relationship around clinical research uh, operates. Um, that, uh, that memorandum of agreement uh, uh, resulted in the establishment of our CRDO, and that's a really important piece of infrastructure in terms of how we relate to each other and how we do our business. 
But it came out of a willingness, I suppose, first of all, to work together, uh, of a partnership that is embedded through many, many decades of history at this time, uh, and also a shared common interest around patient care. Um, all of the speakers already this morning have referred to it, and I'm sure you heard it yesterday as well, the importance of clinical research to patient outcomes. And uh, I really like to try and simpli simplify things for myself because I need to understand them in that way. And one thing I clearly understand, and I've come to understand over the years, is that hospitals with an active clinical research program get better outcomes for their patients. And that's where our agenda and the agenda of the university and the college coalesce. Um, and it's a really important point, um, and it's one to remind ourselves often that that's the point where we have common ground and we must continue to go back to that common ground. I want to thank the university, all of my colleagues in the university, and all of my colleagues in the college um, as well for willingness to focus on that agenda item and to con continue to deliver on it. Over the last couple of weeks, I, I've been reminded on a couple of occasions and uh, and for those that were in family, as was referred to earlier on, apologies if I'm uh, repeating a point that was made there to you, but it is an important point. I was reminded of the importance of work, good, good working relationships, and we're fortunate that there's a really good and a well-established and strong working relationship between the university and the Sales University Healthcare Group. That relationship has now extended beyond just the hospital services into the broader community services and the broader health system as well, and that's really, really important. I suppose the point that I was reminded of, though, is that, you know, that, uh, that relationship, it's not, a, it's not a trophy. It's not something that you put on the mantelpiece and admire. It's not a, a two-liner on the CV of a, of a hospital group CEO. It's something that's living and it's breathing and it needs attention and it needs cultivation every single day, not just by people like myself, but by everybody working in both of those organizations, in order that we can ensure that we stay on that agenda item, that we stay focused on what our common ground is, and that we continue to deliver better outcomes for patients as a result. I was also reminded over recent weeks as well, of course, of the the many opportunities that we have, and people have referred to them. You know, I think one of the key opportunities that we have in this region is people, and it's been referred to over and over this morning, and I'm sure uh, uh, over and over yesterday as well. We have excellent people, excellent clinicians, excellent administrators, excellent people working in the health services, excellent people working in, uh, on the university side. I think the trick for us as coordinators, as managers, is about bringing those people together and then giving the them the environment in which they can do great work. So that's one really great opportunity that I'd, I really want to point to. It's been there for a long time, but we shouldn't take it for granted. We've got excellent people. The second opportunity is more of a structural one, and it's one that's happening within the health services um, currently, and it's just about a change in the way that things are organized. But I think it's an important change. It's an important change about how we deliver care, but it's also an important change that will impact on how we deliver clinical research. So we're forming regional health areas, and people, some people in the audience will know all about this, and they'll be bored to death, but I know those maybe are hearing it for the first time. Um, I look after a hospital group, and we've got six hospitals from Letterkenny down as far as Galway. We manage the hospitals separately from our community services currently. The new regional health areas are about bringing those together, so that we manage them together, and that's the way patient, patients avail of care. I think that creates an opportunity not just for the way that we deliver care, but as I say, also for the way that we deliver clinical research. And I'm really looking forward to how the Institute rolls out over the coming years so that we can focus on ensuring that we've got active clinical research taking place, not just in Galway, but also from Letterkenny, Sligo, Castlebar, Port Yonkla, uh, Roscommon. And of course, not just within the hospitals, but outside of the hospital walls and into the community as well. Again, shared agenda, shared focus, and that's the good outcomes for the population that we're serving jointly. So again, I just want to return to my original point, which is to say that I am actually really glad that I'm here this morning. I'm really glad to be involved at this point and at this launch. I think it's an important day, a really important day, and one that I will look back on hopefully and say, actually, I was there, and it did make a real difference to people living in this region. I'm very grateful to have been invited, and I look forward to the, the success. Tony, thanks, uh, thanks very much for, for, for making time to be here. Uh, a hospital group CEO has a, a many demands on your time, so for being here and for your words of support, we're, we're very grateful. Um, so, uh, to move on, to Anahas Aram, Falcha, Korriv, on Stolcha, on Tulliv, Kiron O'Hogartig, Ukron, Ulskol, and I'm now delighted to welcome uh, to the stage. Uh, 
Professor Keir Otto Hogartig, uh, President of the University of Galway. Peter and Sana Hosser and Van Sharm Majin, V. Peter Giram, Lee Stuhim, and Gwedig, Magalo Rega, Agus Tassam Ragul, Faros, Luck Arman, Gul, Skunna Gwedig, Gar Majin, Agus Squidde, Nadorak, Peter A. Grashe, Borho, Fishin, Agus Garode, Toshe, Goni Swinever, and Regun and Wilshe. So Tant Tamidan of Wicked, Doshu, Agus Divilga, Osvansha. When we talked about our strategy and considered our strategy here a number of years ago now, when I arrived first here to Galway, I talked from this stage of starting with why. The best book on strategy that I've ever read is by Simon Sinek, and it's called Start With Why. And I was sitting earlier thinking, this is why. And when you start with why, a number of things come out of that. First of all, there's a sense of, come, brings us back to values and brings us back to first foundations. And when we do that, we, I think, hit something very profound in what it is to be, to be human beings. So you don't necessarily start about, think about process or how or what we're going to do or the buildings we're going to build, but you start with why we're here. And that then brings you back to values. And we said very clearly at the beginning of our strategy that we would commit to three things. First of all, that we were here for our students here for society, and here for our planet. We would commit to being here for the public good, and that's something that universities, you would take for granted, possibly, particularly public universities, but we don't often say enough. And when you're here for the public good, you're here for others. So that transforms your whole decision-making around not being here for me, or for us, or for the people within this university, but we're here for the people outside. And we bring those people inside. And this is a very important part of that process in that this uh, launch today, Future Trials, the Institute for Clinical Research, is really for the public good and has that sense of values of being for other people, which exudes much of what we do, as has been mentioned already, public patient involvement, the Cochrane uh, Group for Evidence and Research, much of what we do in this university every day is for the public good and for others and not for us. The second thing you come to is a set of values. So then we talked about why, why we were here and what values therefore inform what we do every day. And as Peter has mentioned, there were four values we coalesced around. The first of those being respect. And respect is an interesting word because it me, it, it's sometimes loaded, has very different meanings for different people. People can sometimes see it as soft, when in fact, respect is a high challenge. Respect is a two-way street. We give it and we expect it. But respect is also about respect for ourselves, for sure. Respect for the evidence. Respect for research. Respect for other people. And that brought us to our second value, because when you respect other people, you, you do your best work. And the value of excellence mar is married with respect. Very often it, they're seen as sometimes contradictory when they're not. And that excellence exudes the, this launch yesterday and today. A lot of what was talked about is the need for excellence. And that is based on respect and working for other people and doing our best work for other people. And in this area in particular, that is particularly important as we know. And the third value is the value of openness. And this, that, again, is very clear today, that this is a university that wants to work with others. Tony has mentioned it, Mairead has mentioned it. And we are, see ourselves as a national institution with international reputation and reach starting today. So one of the things I often talk about, and hopefully colleagues will forgive me for mentioning it again, is uh, at the back of the quadrangle, behind the aula, uh, there is, there's, a, there's a high wall. And I've, I, I used to walk from where I lived in Myola Park, uh, into town through this campus and felt this, was, this campus was my own, part of my furniture. Not everybody felt that way. And one of the things I often have talked about in, since coming here is a bit like Ronald Reagan asking the Berlin Wall to be knocked down, is that we tear down the wall. We can't because it, there's a potentially preservation order on it, people like it, but what we did was there's a small door in the wall and we simply opened the door, the last door to be opened in the university. 
And as it happens, that door is on the hospital side of the university. And to me, that's also symbolic of our work, not only with the broader public, but with the hospital and the healthcare ecosystem in particular. And what that means is this is a university with no gates. And as you see when you come in, this is a very open campus, but it's open not just physically, but also conceptually, metaphorically. And today is a day when we say we reach out and we want to be open. We want to work with you. We want to, as Peter said, be a good partner. And that sometimes means we lead as we do today, but sometimes means we don't. We, we come with you. And that's a very important principle we have here, is that sense of openness means that we're open to critique, open to dialogue, open to challenge, and open to working with others. And then the final value we coalesced around, and particularly our students demanded this, as you'd expect of the next generation, was the value of sustainability, as Peter has mentioned. And sustainability is, has, is again, a multifaceted term in that it means, as we know, environmentally friendly, uh, and we are uh, working, as Peter has said, in that regard also to make sure that we, 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 we don't leave a footprint behind that's damaging to the environment. And we are, as the University of Galway, currently number one in Ireland and top 50 in the world for our impact on sustainable development goals. Top 50 in the world and proud of it. But the thing about the sustainable development goals is they're not only about the environment, and there is number three, which is about good health and well-being. And today, not only do we commit ourselves to sustainability in that broader environmental sense, but also in the context of good health and well-being. And our contribution, our commitment, our dedication to that is launched today and continued today, building on the work of others uh, and the work of this university more generally. So this particular launch exudes the values of this university. Respect, excellence, openness, and sustainability. It exudes our commitment to being for the public good. And that's why we started with why. The second thing that happens when you start with why and you do land on or coalesce around values is that people come with you. And I'm very conscious that when you, when you create what I hope is a decent organization, a good place to be, a place that has a purpose, that starts with why, good people come. And today I think we see that with yourselves here. Peter has joined us and I, I, I think part of what Peter brings is our values par excellence. We know him as a person with, with deep commitment and values and that to me is, is particularly important when we appoint leadership positions here. And there's a concept in marketing called buyer's remorse. And in fact, if, I don't know if there's an opposite, but we have buyer's delight uh, with Peter's appointment, as Martin has said. He's made a huge difference since coming here, not only in his drive and in his dedication and his determination, but also in his humanity and his, his personality. And I think that brings us a long way. It really, uh, it to me, embodies the values of what it is to have values as a university. And I'd like to thank Peter for that and for all that he's done thus far. And I'd also like to thank Martin and uh, Tim and others. Martina was mentioned earlier, but I, I remember, uh, and I was saying to Martin when, when, he, was, uh, when, we, when he sat down, uh, that I remember meeting him when I came first. So when I came here first, I did a listening tour. And I went over to Martin in his offices at, in the CRF at the time. And we had uh, what I would always consider, and I always uh, feel grateful and appreciate from Martin, an adult, serious, frank conversation. And it's one of the reasons why he's an excellent colleague on our management team as executive dean of the college. And I distinctly remember words that Martin said that I've quoted since, is that in this area, we should go big or go home. And today we're going big. And I think that's a commitment that we've made as a university, that Martin has made as dean of the college, that builds on a lot of the work of others. But we could have decided to go home, but we didn't. And we didn't because this matters. This is part of why we are here. That's starting with why. And the third thing that in, con in the context of starting with why is, I'm particularly pleased in this session, that we'll finish with why. Because we, we have Noreen Doyle joining us, a patient advocate, to formally launch uh, the future trials, the, the Institute for Clinical Trials. And for me, that's particularly important because it goes back to the reason why we are here, starting with why. 
And for me, that inverts the whole relationship we have as a university, the way we, the, the way, the, the why we exist and the way we work, is that we invert our thinking and we focus on the outside first and we bring others in and we go out. And therefore, I'm particularly pleased that to, to be part of this launch and to the extent that I'm the penultimate person who finally, uh, today at this session, launches the, this Future Trials Institute, I'm particularly proud because we mentioned that an all-staff meeting the other day, if there are legacies of this time and this university in this place, and people look back in 30, 40, 50 years, what will they see? And they'll see, I think, our commitment to sustainability, our, our, our leadership position in Ireland and our leadership position internationally, top 50 in the world in sustainable development goals and our impact on those. But they'll also see this day, and they'll see that this day we committed to being going big in future trials and clinical trials. And we did it because of who's coming next and the people she represents. Noreen Doyle, a patient advocate. We do it for others, for the public good. Grimin Mahagav, and I'll introduce Noreen Doyle. Thank you very much. Uh, so before I start, I'd just like to thank Peter Dorn and everyone here for inviting me along today. I'd also like to acknowledge Neve Connolly and all her team and the amazing work she has done and all the help she has been to me over the last few days. Um, this event is a credit to everyone that's been involved and I'm very humbled to be able to share my story with all of you. So my name is Noreen, Noreen Doyle. I am monster bred, living in Leinster, but a very keen supporter of Connacht Rugby. And I'm also the mother of four teenage children, ranging in age from 19 to 13. In January 2007, I found myself in A&E in Crumlin with my son James. He had just turned two one month previous to that day. And after months of going in and out to our GP, being told he just had snots and sneezes, that I was fretting because I was five months pregnant with my third child, we had a three and a half year old at home. But that day I knew that there was something wrong with my son and I wasn't taking no for an answer. And a number of hours later, James was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Our lives as we knew them completely stopped. On that day was the first day that I met Professor Owen Smith and he and his team took over the care of my son. And very quickly, I had to learn about white blood cells, neutropenia, catheter, Hickman's, um, fondly known as Freddy's. And over those first few days, I also got to learn about clinical trials. Never heard about them before. I never had a need to. And it was explained to us that no matter what protocol James was going to be randomized into, he was still going to get the best medical care. But perhaps in years to come, the learnings from his uh, duration of treatment might actually help another child down the line, another family to endure the situation, make it a little bit easier, a little bit more tolerable. And so began four and a half years of treatment, a lot of ups and downs. We had a lot of holidays in St. John's Ward in Crumlin over those years. And James started his treatment. And finally, in 2012, James finished his treatment and we left the community of St. John's Ward, hoping never to have to go back. And he is now a healthy 18-year-old boy, preparing for his leaving cert, supposedly, in a, <laughs> in a week's time. But he's much more interested in cars and pretty girls. And it would be lovely to finish the story there, but, well, there's always a but. In 2017, 10 years later, 10 years following James' first diagnosis, his younger sister, Kate, who was six at the time, was sent home from school one day, and she wasn't feeling particularly well. And she had that horrible pale color. She was napping a lot, 
and I got this horrible feeling in my gut. And I went straight back to that poor GP and said, there's something wrong, you know, there's something wrong with her. And um, I wasn't leaving it go, I was bringing her straight to a and &E. And uh, I was lucky that I had Prof Smith's number still in my phone. And I texted him and I said, you're not gonna believe this, but I'm here and they're talking about blood counts again and I'm really worried. And the following morning, Prof came into us and Kate was diagnosed with exactly the same leukemia as her brother. To say that we were knocked sideways is an understatement. Um, all I could think of was, Jesus, you know, here we go again, another four and a half years. My child is only six. Her first communion was coming up in a month's time. How was she going to cope? How were we going to cope? You know, if I have a family of four children now. We run our own business. We were, I was so angry. I was really, I was really not happy. But then, Professor Owen Smith explained to me that 10 years ago when we entered James into that trial, hoping that it would actually help a child down the line, that trial was going to help her, his own sister. It was going to make the difference. And suddenly, this journey became almost okay. We thought, you know, we can do this. And so we discovered that over the 10 years between the two children's diagnosis, medicine had improved so much that a lot of the toxic chemo drugs that James had to take and endure, which he stopped walking, he had lots and lots of setbacks, he had a lot of side effects from a lot of the very heavy toxic chemo, she wouldn't have to necessarily go through that. This was going to be a walk in the park as far as I was concerned when I heard that. Plus, on top of that, the duration of her treatment was cut dramatically. The prognosis for James 10 years previous was 80% plus. Now hers was going to be 90% plus. This was complete music to our ears. It gave us incredible hope. And in just over two years, on the 29th of May 2019, Kate finished her last chemotherapy. This is her with Professor Smith on the last day in Crumlin. And today, Kate is a healthy 13-year-old child, 14 in one week. She loves rugby, she loves ga, she loves horse riding, she loves fake tan, <laughs> she loves boys with cute smiles, but she's a great kid. My children show without question without question, the importance of clinical trials. If I could, I would spend every day explaining to people how important and how they give such amazing hope to families like us. Thank you for listening. Noreen, thank you. Um, this is the why uh, that the President referred to, to earlier. Uh, so thank you. Uh, your support, your story drives us all on and, and we're really grateful. Uh, I hope nobody will mind, but it would be remiss of me if I, if I didn't point out to those who know that uh, Professor Owen Smith is with us in the audience here today. Uh, Owen, thank you for your leadership in uh, clinical research over the decades in Ireland. Thank you for your support for me personally, but also your support for the Institute for Clinical Trials as you've, you've attended today. So, Owen, thank you. <laughs> We're going to conclude this session now, and I'm going to invite my, my great colleague, Dr. Martina Nikulan, uh, to the stage who's going to, to say a final few words to close out that session. And uh, Martina, uh, you're very welcome. Noreen, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's heartwarming to see how such a difficult time in your lives 
was made a little bit easier through clinical trials and how it has retained the wholeness of your family. Thank you also to Kate Cameron and Carmel McDonough and their families for sharing their stories and the generosity. By placing patients at the heart of research, we empower them to actively participate and provide meaningful insights, shape the direction of medical advancements. This patient-centered approach not only enhances trial outcomes, but also reinforces the ethical foundation upon which our work rests. Over the past two days, we have witnessed the transformative powers of clinical trials. We have heard remarkable stories of individuals whose lives have been forever altered by the interventions tested within these trials. It is a testament to the unwavering commitment of researchers, healthcare professionals and patients who have embraced the unknown, facing adversity head on, to pave the way for a healthier future. As we move forward, let us remember the importance of collaboration, mutual trust, and let's retain a make it happen attitude. Scientific breakthroughs are rarely solitary endeavors, but rather the result of a collective effort fueled by collaborations across borders, disciplines, and institutions. By sharing our insights, learnings, and best practice, we can accelerate the pace of discovery, avoid duplication of efforts, and maximize the impact of our work. I now invite you to take a quick coffee break before the next session, which will be ably hosted by Anton Savage, where we will talk about trials in action, and we'll get the perspectives of the two Secretary Generals on the important topic that straddles the two uh, portfolios of education and health. Gurmila Magi.